Hey friends, this is a little makeup lecture for those of you who might have missed our discussion of the Congo history last week due to the uh, attempted coup in Washington, D.C. I'm going to try to go as fast as I can and keep this from being too long. Um, the Congo was discovered by Europeans in 1482 when Diego Sao, a Portuguese explorer, took one of these, it's called a caravel, and sailed down the coast of Africa and came to a place where there was a huge burst of water coming out from the beach that was not salt water and surrounded his ship. And he realized that he was observing the mouth of an amazing and huge river and that was the Congo River. Um, his attempts to sail up the river were, were uh, prevented by a huge um, cascade of rocks, but um, nonetheless, he planted the Portuguese flag and the Portuguese introduced themselves to the people of the Congo and began to do business there. Um, the Congo that they discovered was in fact, maybe you know what they had thought they might someday see the kingdom of Prester John in the sense that it was a huge kingdom run by a very powerful king who had um, sub-kings and sub-kingdoms at his uh, command. Um, the king of the Congo was called the Mani Congo. And we don't know what he might have looked like or how he might have ruled very much except through the eyes of the Portuguese. So you have to kind of take that into account when you see these Portuguese paintings. Nonetheless, um, they were impressed. Um, but they set about doing business in the Congo and their business was slavery. Um, what the Portuguese started to do was to uh, buy slaves from the Congolese government of the time. And then eventually they took to just kidnapping people from Congo. Um, they would um, pay people to kidnap folks for them uh, with a combination of alcohol and guns. And um, the trade became so enormous that um, the, the, this is about you know, 50 years, 70 years into the Portuguese engagement, um, the Mani Congo named Alfonso I actually began to write a series of letters that we have records of to the King of Portugal demanding that the Portuguese stop doing business in Congo. Um, and Alfonso I was a converted Christian, I'm very enthusiastic about, um, about what he was learning from the Portuguese, but very clear that, that uh, slavery was bad for the Congo and he wanted to put a stop to it. He says that uh, even people in the royal family were getting kidnapped because there was such a huge trade in people. We don't know how much the, the, the population of the Congo was damaged by this trade, um, but it was in the millions. And most of the Congolese enslaved people were brought to Brazil, Portugal's colony on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, but at least a fifth of them ended up in the United States. And this is why uh, you can see the, uh, the history of Congolese culture in some of the cultural traditions of people in South Carolina. Um, the next wave of European engagement in Congo happened because of this man, uh, David Livingston. So David Livingston was uh, you know, an explorer and a missionary, and he traveled all throughout Central Africa looking for the source of the Nile. At one point, he was out of communication with the rest of Europe for many, many years, and a man named Henry Morton Stanley was employed by the King of Belgium to go and find David Livingston and um, bring him out of Africa. He was successful in finding him. He wasn't successful in convincing him to leave. Um, but along the way, Morton Stanley made some discoveries about the Congo and planted the Portuguese, uh, the Belgian flag on behalf of the Belgian king, uh, King Leopold. And um, then he, he sort of conspired with the Belgian king to work it out that Belgium would end up uh, owning the Congo as a colony. So the way that happened is that uh, king Leopold was a new king of a new country. Belgium was just brand new. And in terms of its relative power to other European countries, it was tiny uh, it, and had very little wealth. But King Leopold wanted to change all of that. He wanted to make Belgium a player. And he knew that having a colony was going to be a big part of that. Um, what he learned from Stanley about uh, what was there in the Congo convinced him that this was Belgium's opportunity. So he took his case to a meeting of all the European powers in 1884. Uh, 
four. And that meeting, which took place in Europe and involved no Africans, divided up the continent of Africa among the European powers. So King Leopold asked, insisted, whined, complained, begged that Belgium get one colony and that it be the central part of Africa around the Congo River. And um, eventually folks granted it to him mostly because he was so whiny, but they were not sure about it. Obviously, Britain and France really wanted most of the continent for themselves. Um, and King Leopold assured them that he would uh, he would make this worth their while because he was going to personally stop the slave trade out of Central Africa. So because this was 1884 and Britain and France had newly abandoned their uh, association with slavery, it's, it gave them a nice cover story to say, you know, King Leopold of Belgium is going to take care of slavery in the central part of Africa for us. He's going to end the practice. And um, that's a good thing. So we'll give him this colony. And then they ignored what was going on and paid almost no attention to what Leopold was doing. So Leopold and Stanley's idea was that uh, Stanley had told King Leopold that there was a lot of rubber vines in the, in his observation of the communities near the river in the Congo and that people were using rubber for various things so he knew that the people of the Congo could get access to rubber. Rubber had suddenly become a thing in the in the world because of the invention of the bicycle. So this is the late 1880s there's no cars yet but the bicycle had been invented and these early bicycles that had wooden wheels they really sucked. So uh, in the late 1880s, this man named Dun Dunlop had the idea to make rubber tires for bicycles, and that turned this this invention into something that just took over. Everyone wanted a bicycle in Europe. Everyone wanted a bicycle in the United States, and um, there was a huge demand for rubber to make those tires. Also, the condom had been per the latex condom, natural rubber condom, had been perfected, and that was increasing the demand for rubber. So they knew they had a big business if they could just get this rubber out of the Congo and sell it to the rest of the world. And that is what King Leopold set about to do. Something that's important to notice is that the Congo became his personal colony, not a colony of Belgium, but a personal colony of the king. So what happens next is entirely down to him. The buck stops there. But no one really knew what was going on in the Congo. As far as they knew, it was fine. King Leopold called it the Congo Free State, and that sounded really fine. That all changed because of the work of some enterprising individuals around the world who became concerned about what was going on in Congo. Interesting story. Uh, one of those persons was William Shepard, uh, an American uh, priest in the Lutheran Church who went to Congo as a missionary to try to convert people to Christianity. And what he saw was that um, King Leopold's troops were disciplining the Congolese people by cutting off hands and feet, that they were kidnapping uh, women and children and forcing men into service uh, with the threat of the loss of their uh, wives and children. And um, he didn't quite understand the full significance of this, but he knew it was a problem. So he started talking to a lot of people. And then he met this man, Edmund Morrell. Morrell's just like an ordinary guy who started working right out of high school as an accountant. And he was working, it happened, for the business that King Leopold had set up called Elder, Elder Dempster. His job was to keep track of how much came off each boat and how much went back on the boats that went back to the Congo. What he observed was that King Leopold was not sending anything to the Congo besides weapons, and yet he was pulling out of the Congo incredibly valuable cargo of rubber, ivory, and ebony. And so how was he obtaining this? He could not possibly be paying for it because there was nothing with which to pay um, the people of the Congo for that trade. By putting two and two together, Shepard and Morel were able to release a report in which they told the world that they thought King Leopold was running a slave colony in Congo and brutalizing the Congolese people. This was so, even in a time when imperialism was accepted by everyone in the world, this was so horrible to the world that it caught a lot of people's imagination. Mark Twain wrote a book about it. Uh, there began to be an international letter writing campaign to stop King Leopold and his um, trade in the Congo. 
Um, one of the people who took up that cause is this man, Roger Casement, who was sent by the British government to investigate the claims of Morrell and Shepard. And he came back with a report that was damning that said that, you know, millions were dying in the Congo. Casement's a personal hero of mine because he went on to write uh, exposés about the British behavior in the um, in the area of Peru and also um, to be involved in the Irish liberation movement. So he was a, what you call an intersectional thinker. Um, he was eventually condemned to death by the British for his work with un Irish liberation. And part of the reason why he was treated so brutally by his own government is because he was gay. Um, so Caseman writes a report and a lot of pictures were taken. And this is the story that the world found out that that um, men were being forced into getting rubber for King Leopold by having their children and, and families kidnapped. And many times the hands and feet of their children would be cut off as punishment for them not getting enough rubber. Um, the estimate is that about 8 to 10 million people died in this uh, period of time when King Leopold controlled the Congo. And King Leopold became one of the wealthiest men in the world. So this was so extraordinarily brutal and people were so upset about it that even the, the imperialist world of Europe and the United States was upset. And eventually the Belgian government just took the colony away from King Leopold and decided to run it directly out of the Belgian government. Um, they ended the practice of forced labor and began paying people for their work. But in other respects, it was really just a regular colony and had all the same uh, problems and issues that colonies had. Um, King Leopold was still celebrated. It's almost like this entire story, which is not hidden at all, just gets buried. It's not in your textbook. It's not, it wasn't, it dropped from the news. And um, all throughout Belgium, you see these statues celebrating King Leopold and his legacy. There's a museum about him. It's just on and on. He is uh, has been completely whitewashed. And so you can imagine how exciting it was for um, Congolese people and uh, folks who are concerned about uh, anti-racism in Belgium to have this summer a huge Black Lives Matter movement in Belgium that um, took down some of those statues. And this is one of them that was, um, you know, uh, marked up by the protesters before it was eventually taken down. Um, so just, you know, we're here, hundreds of years later, just at the beginning of Belgium, beginning to accept responsibility for what happened under King Leopold. What the Belgians did with their colony in Congo was to um, expand the business. They moved from rubber into mining, and they uh, found that Congo was an excellent source of a whole variety of valuable things, diamonds, gold, copper. And now, of course, Congolese mines have cobalt and coal tan, which are useful in the modern world. Um, manganese, lead, and eventually also uranium, which um, led the United States to be very interested in what happened in the Congo. So by 1960, it was uncool to have colonies. The Congolese people were in a state of full rebellion against the Belgians, and the Belgians agreed to leave and let Congo become an independent state. Um, there were elections held, and um, by all accounts, they were um, you know, very solid elections, considering how difficult it would be to hold elections in a country like this. Um, the man who was elected prime minister of Congo was Patrice Lumumba. Patrice Lumumba had an interesting idea. He wanted to use the wealth of all of those mines, not for the Belgians, but for the Congolese. He wanted to have the government own the mines and invest all of the profits in education and roads and the things that Congo needed. Um, that was upsetting to the United States in particular because they thought they might lose control of the uranium mines. So um, what actually happened is that the United States and France conspired with the military in Congo to have Lumumba arrested and assassinated just a year after he became the prime minister. And the man who took over was a military leader from the Congo, this man Mobutu, um, a man who uh, was friends with the United States government and was willing to do, um, you know, all the things that the United States government wanted to make sure that there was a continuous flow of uranium out of Congo and towards the United States. Mobutu invented, in a way, uh, he's really the, the first use of the word kleptocracy that I can come up with. He became fabulously rich. 
Um, he, he, he seemed to receive the personal benefits of every mine in Congo, but absolutely nothing happened in the Congo under his rule in terms of improvement of conditions or infrastructure or education. The school that I went to there, uh, you know, in the 70s was still using textbooks that were printed by the Belgians uh, back when it was their colony. So almost nothing happened except that Mobutu became fabulously rich, built castle in Paris and, um, um, and remained the dictator for over 30 years. In 1997, that all changed because of the Rwandan genocide. And Rwanda sent troops into Congo after the fleeing Hutu people and the Hutu uh, genocidiers, the com people who committed the genocide, as well as many innocent people who just happened to be Hutu, fleeing from Rwanda as the Tutsi government took back control in Rwanda to end the genocide there, these folks came into Congo and that began uh, a genocide in the Congo. In, um, in The Rwandan government followed the Hutu into Congo and killed millions of people. They went all the way to the capital and they um, helped uh, Congolese rebels to put Mobutu out of power and to put this man Laurent Kabila in power. Um, however, Laurent Kabila didn't uh, want to do exactly what the Rwandan government wanted him to do. So his own son um, became president a few years later after what appears to be an assassination. Um, some people call it an accident. And um, Joseph Kabila became the Rwanda-supported uh, dictator of Congo right up until 2019, uh, just a few years ago. Um, in 2018, he was supposed to have elections, uh, and I'll tell you about that in a second. But what I want to say is that the Rwandan presence in Congo led to other countries getting involved. And by during the early years of um, Kabila's rule, there was a, a continent-wide war centered on Congo, um, which was a partly about what was going to happen to these Hutu militias and other militias, but it mostly is about access to these very valuable mines that are mining coltan and cobalt right along the border here. Um, so many countries were involved, including the United States and France, Iran, Russia, in terms of supplying weapons, and the fighting was so widespread and um, so um, so vicious that over six million people died. So this is what I call the third genocide in Congo. If you figure slavery was the first, King Leopold's forced labor regime was the second, then this world war, which is very rarely discussed in international media, but easily confirmed, um, is the third. Um, it was eventually sort of tamped down by a peace agreement in 2003, but there's still fighting in this area around those mines today. So in 2018, um, the dictator Kabila agreed to have elections. It took actually a year of protests to hold him to his promise. There was an election which was um, uh, it had three candidates, um, Kabila, the dictator, a, a united opposition candidate, and a third candidate, this guy, Felix Chiketi, and he is basically the son of a kind of popular guy, politician. Um, and uh, surprisingly, the, although the Catholic Church, which was in charge of observing the elections, thought that the opposition candidate won after a full month of radio silence, there was no internet, no nothing in Congo, uh, it was suddenly announced that Chiketi, the third, everyone, who everyone thought was the third place candidate, was actually going to become the president. Um, so was that a fair election? We don't know. Yeah. Um, it was definitely contested in the street, you know, but uh, in the end, um, the world seemed to want a peaceful transfer of power more than they wanted a real election. And so that is the condition in Congo today. Um, and I will uh, let you explore more using the resources on the class website if you're interested.